Check one, two. Check one, two. Hey, hey, hey. Syllabus, syllabus, syllabus. Flip the switch. But I can't hear anything. Oh. Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome back. Um, thanks. This is a great turnout for the first week of uh, the semester. Uh, I'm Philip Munoz. I'm the director of the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. It's my pleasure to, to welcome you back on behalf of the center for what should be an exciting year. I just want to say a special thanks to, well, I, she knew I was going to do it, so to Soren Greffenstadt, who arranged for all the lunches, um, so we all owe her uh, a thanks, and um, my co-director, Don Stuletto, for all the work he did to put this in. So the, the staff really carries the burden, so I'm not always good about acknowledging them, so thank you, to, especially to Soren and Don in this one. Um, we have lots of things going on this semester, especially for students. Um, so for you students who are interested in events like today, uh, the Constitutional Studies minor, we have a Tocqueville Fellowship program, we're doing uh, weekend seminars, make sure you come talk to me um, or uh, look up Debbie O'Malley who works with our students, Debbie's out of town today. Uh, but especially for your students, come find out about what the center is doing, especially if you're interested in events uh, like today. I'm going to introduce um, uh, Luca here to introduce our speaker, but I'm going to do something I usually don't do. Um, in preparing for, um, Professor Rogers has been here, we spent much of the last 24 hours together and I've uh, been reading his book, and in preparing for the, 
uh, his visit, um, I was reading some of the reviews of the book. And I haven't done this before, but I want to read this paragraph from one of the reviews. You mentioned this review, but you undersold it. This is how um, uh, this uh, a review, prominent review, uh, concludes. Of the many books recently published about African American political thought, The Dark and Light of Faith will stand the test of time and will be seen as an important contribution to this conversation, if not an outright classic. It offers a realistic assessment of the country's mistakes on slavery, segregation, and discrimination, and offers an equally realistic path forward to address these problems that continue to plague us. At a time when ridiculous and dangerous views about race are voiced in the public square, we need a sensible and hopeful one. The dark and light of faith is such a voice. Having spent um, the last day uh, with Professor Rogers, having been reading his book, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, that you're joining us and really pleased uh, for today's event. And when the lights come back on. <laughs> There we go. Not so dark. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Luca, you're a junior, correct? Yes. Luca's a, a fellow, and he works in the, the, uh, one of our student workers, and he's going to introduce our speaker. Luca? Could you see if the mic's working? This one here? Uh, the, mic the microphones, I think, are for the recording. Oh, okay. Yes. Don't worry. I talk pretty loud, so <laughs> at least I've been told. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Melvin Rogers. Professor Rogers is the professor of political science and the associate director of the Center for Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at Brown University. Focused on contemporary democratic theory and the history of American and African-American political thought, Professor Rogers has authored and edited multiple books including The Undiscovered Dewey, Religion, Morality, and the Ethos of Democracy, and The Darkened Light of Faith, Race, Democracy, and Freedom in African-American Political Thought. His articles have appeared in major academic journals and popular venues such as Dissent, The Atlantic, Public Seminar, and Boston Review. He is also an award-winning speaker on race and democracy in American culture and politics. Professor Rogers studied political thought and intellectual history from Cambridge in 2000, and he received a PhD in political science from Yale University in 2006. Today, Professor Rogers will be discussing the late James Baldwin, an American writer and civil rights activist, and the ideas of history, responsibility, and atonement. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Melvin Rogers. Thank you, thank you. I don't, think I, I don't think I need this one. Is my mic on? I, I, I flipped the switch here. Can you hear me? Well, first, let me thank uh, Philip for the wonderful invitation. Let me thank Don, who has been, uh, just to sort of be quite frank, has just been attending to me. Thank you so very much, um, giving me a wonderful historical sense of, of Notre Dame. Um, and so thank you so very, very much. Um, and although it is chilly outside, I have received nothing but a warm welcome. So uh, since last night, this morning, we've been having a good time. So thank you very much, and thank all of you for attending. So let me, um, let's, let's jump into this. So the talk today uh, is drawn from the conclusion of the dark and light of faith. And let me just say very briefly a word or two about, about the book itself. At the heart of the book uh, is an attempt to understand uh, why it is African Americans in the 19th century and the early 20th century remain committed to the American polity amid various forms of exclusion and domination and the like. 
or to think about it differently, how must they have understood democracy such that they could make sense, even if only to themselves, their various appeals to the nation for inclusion. And across the book, uh, centering on a number of, of figures, I try to sort of lay out their understanding of democracy and what they think is required of us to realize the ideal of democracy. And one of the elements of this argument is that they are committed to an aspirational notion of politics. That when we think of American uh, discourse, we constantly hear the language of the people, we the people. And one of the things you come to discover in American political and African American political thought is that that concept of the people works in two ways. One way is descriptive. That when we say the people, we mean those who enjoy rights and privileges per the Constitution. But there's another sense in which we mean the people when we think of a people not yet, uh, a people that may yet be. And in this register, the people is, is used as a kind of aspirational concept. By the time we get to the end of the book, one of the things that becomes clear, one of the questions I raise, is how do we guard against this concept of the people in the aspirational sense from being captured by some of our false notions about who we are, that we're exceptional, that we're special, that has its own kind of aspirational ring. So how do we guard against that? And so the conclusion is about how we hold on uh, to aspirational politics without it being deformed by what I think are misdescriptions of, uh, of the nation, that we're exceptional and special and all these kinds of things. And so that is where, that's where this talk picks up. So I'm going to turn to the dominant model of liberalism, racial liberalism, that defined the second half of the 20th century, and what I will now call its deformed aspirational politics. We see it in, in a kind of popularized form, a very powerful form, in the Swedish sociologist Gunnar Myrdal in 1944, in his classic text, An American Dilemma, the Negro Problem in Modern Democracy. And in that work, Miral deploys liberalism's commitment to freedom, equal regard, and social justice to address racial inequality. That book is about responding to racial inequality. From the 1940s to the 1960s, racial liberalism shaped social, legal, economic, and political engineering. Miral is a representative example of a way of thinking about the United States history of racial discrimination and its quest to realize a just society. In an American dilemma, we find what I will call a once-born liberalism, a once-born liberalism with little place for sin and tragedy. To read him as I do is to get at his aspirational politics and the underlying attitude informing his vision. It is an attitude of evasion, and it is still with us today. Against the backdrop of Myrdal, I will turn to one of the most critical responses of the period, the thinking of James Baldwin. His writings captured the public imagination and shamed the political establishment as the black freedom struggle was coming clearly into view in the early 1960s. I turn to Baldwin because in him, we find an attenuated aspirational politics born as it was from seeing both the promises and the betrayals of the United States. In his writings, we discover his confrontation with the irrevocable deeds of white supremacy, and yet the necessity of responding to it all the same because, well, alas, we are responsible for the communities to which we belong. To call it irrevocable is to focus on the soul-scarring character of white supremacy, for which, as Baldwin says, neither he nor time nor history will ever forgive. But I insist that the scarred soul of the nation ironically shapes Baldwin's outlook, his view of identity, of history, and the ethical themes of responsibility, of forgiveness, of redemption, and atonement. All of these words will be at home at this place, yes? <laughs> 
If Mirror offers us an attitude of evasion, then Baldwin offers us an attitude in which we must be critically responsive to history. And that's the point of the lecture today. In commending critical responsiveness as an ethical and political virtue, Baldwin resists the antinomies of redemption and irreparability. So our journey will begin with Miro. And then we will shift to Baldwin. And along the way, we will encounter other figures. The psychologist William James, the philosopher Sidney Hook, the cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead, the political theorist Iris Marion Young, the philosopher, Josiah Royce. And I think if we stay close, holding hands, maybe not literally, we won't lose our way, but I'll check on you midway through, okay? So Gunnar Mirall. Gunnar Mirall is an American dilemma represented a major statement on race and inequality when it was published in 1944. Doubting the ability of Americans to offer an objective analysis of race in America, the Carnegie Corporation commissioned the study in 1938 and selected the Swedish economist, Miral. He, in turn, enlisted some of the most gifted scholars of race in the fields of history, sociology, economics, and political science. And in the study, Miral embraces a specific kind of moralism latent in American culture. He opens and closes the massive study, parts one and 11, spanning well over 1,000 pages, by framing the problem of racial inequality in terms of the crisis of moral commitments among whites and their betrayal of what he calls the American creed. This preoccupation with the American creed is the most enduring part of that text. The text's moral vision aligns itself with the political bent of post-war analysis on race that emphasized the psychological states of individuals and prioritized education and non-discriminatory practices and policies to bring the nation in alignment with his deeply held commitments. The politics of the day and for several decades thereafter also drew support from this very important text. But the framing the framing of all books and the framing of this book matters a great deal. The decision to structure the book in the way he did shapes how we ought to understand the underlying ideological commitments of the United States, the history of racial disregard, and the status of white persons in addressing that history. The book aspires to tell an origin story about who Americans are. Origin stories are very interesting things. They're often determinative. They have, as Edward Said tells us, a divine, mythical, and privileged character that dominates what, de what derives from it. If you've ever played, if you're a gamer, if you've ever played a role-playing game, whether tabletop or on the screen, origin stories matter a great deal. They set the quest. They help you understand your own purpose and the purity of your mission. And they also indicate what happens when you betray the quest, when you fail to adhere to it. And this is why it is vital to me at all to sketch in the very first chapter of the book the origin of the American creed. Behind racial inequality in the United States, he wants us to believe we discover a true community that beckons us a vision of American identity in its pure form. That pure identity is one that is committed, he tells us, to freedom and equal regard, a creed that says that everyone is worthy of respect and the opportunity to chart their own course provided, but it is similar with the right of others to do the same. The pure form of American identity and Miral's religious belief that American democracy is fated to win the battle against white supremacy brings to mind, I want to suggest to you, it brings to mind William James's classic account of the once born soul. Here's our first new figure we encounter. Now, to be fair to Miral, 
James is only invoked once in American Dilemma, and even there, he doesn't invoke James's classic work of 1902, The Varieties of Religious Experience. So why reach for James's text? Well, I want to suggest that the heuristic of the once-born soul captures Miro's brand of liberalism. Heuristics are mental shortcuts that economize our, our thinking. And when they are about the world, they declutter the landscape for us. But they can also be too neat. They can settle too much. And in this case, that's the point. For me at all, the American creed functions in this way, and behind the creed is the once-born soul. In his varieties of religious experience, James distinguishes between two ideal types, the once-born and twice-born souls. Now, he acknowledges that most of us are of a mixed variety, but what is of significance is that these different types of soul, souls embody different kinds of attitudinal orientations toward the world. The firstborn, James tells us, has a healthy-minded attitude and often, quote, looks on all things and sees that they are good. In the systematic variety of healthy-mindedness, it selects one aspect of the world as its essence for the time being and disregards all other aspects. In order to resist humanity's constant struggle and violation of its own highest image, the once-born consistently retreats to an affirmative feature of human life and claim that feature as humanity's essence. In contrast, James says the twice-born soul sees both the light and the persistent of the dark features, the persistence of the dark features of human life. The doctrine of the twice-born, James explains, holds as it does more of the element of evil in view. It is the wider and completer view. Now, James's point is not that the once-born soul cannot acknowledge evil, but importantly, evil factors as an anomaly of human life, and thus the once-born is prevented from accepting evil as a real and durable feature, feature of human life. As he says of the once-born, quote, the world is a sort of one story to fear with accounts that are kept in one denomination whose parts have just the values which naturally they appear to have. The once born, he says, lives on the plus side of life. The textual echo of the once born lives in the American dilemma, but to notice it, we must track Miro's description of the problem. In his introduction, he captures the heart of the issue. Here is Miro, quote, the American Negro problem is a problem in the heart of the American. It is there that the interracial tension has its focus. It is there that the decisive struggle goes on. This is the central viewpoint of this treatise. Though our study includes economic, social, and political race relations, at bottom our problem is a moral dilemma of the American, the conflict between his moral valuations on various levels of consciousness and generality. What is Miro going on about here? His point is that white Americans are pulled in two directions. On the one hand, they believe in freedom and equality, which defines the American creed, yet on the other, there are a variety of prejudices against African Americans that betray the creed. For Miro, each white American carries within their breast this tension and it dogs their psyche and wreaks havoc on the external community in which African Americans live. Now, although Miro says that there is no, and this is, these are his words, no homogenous attitudes, but a mesh of struggling inclinations, interests, and ideals, he maintains, and these are his words as well, that the American creed is the morally higher and truer description of the United States. This is Mira isolating what he takes to be the essence of the American polity, as the once born often does. He treats the history of racial domination as an aberration within American life and thus set about the task of educating the citizenry to their true commitments. Mira partitions the past between those features that truly 
convey American ideals and those that reflect anomalies within the national identity. This is why he says, quote, in principle, the Negro problem was settled long ago. Well, what does that mean? For him, the scope of freedom was clear and the conditions of equality were properly understood, but the application was limited. Now, Miro's text is not merely descriptive. It articulates a normative aspiration. His elevated notion of our national identity whispers even today you can hear it to our souls like ministering angels and comforts the heart. So it is not unsurprising that an American dilemma became a text not only for the academic but for the layperson as well. As abridged versions of this volume were circulated in the 1940s and 50s. And there is, when you read it, a kind of contextual sensitivity at work that anchors the reader. An American Dilemma is filled with examples, both in, interpersonal and structural, of the workings of white supremacy, of the domination of black people. But they inhabit the text in a particular way and shape the nation and shape how we, in the nation, should think about its identity amid racial disregard. Ultimately, narrating the American dilemma works by fragmenting not what we remember, but how we remember it. The past flows away from us into the gut of our horrible deeds, giving us the impression that they form no true part of our shared identity, that they do not touch the nation's soul. The details of the past are called forth and seemingly shape the present, but Miro sequesters them, allowing Americans to say, in the 1940s, as we so often say today, this is not who we are. He encourages his readers to take comfort that the vision of life on display in the 1940s is not there. He is not theirs. He sanctions the thought that the prejudices that constrain black life are not also of America's will, ever on the quest for an unsullied ethical identity. Miral ironically deforms our way of seeing the full picture of our humanity. And in that deformation, he leaves us less than human, less responsive to our shared, even if tragic, inheritance, and less attuned as a result to the sources of racial injustice. And at precisely this moment, we can hear James Baldwin, two decades later, in his 1964 essay, The White Problem. The backdrop of this striking essay is a weighty context, and it's worth recounting some of the notable events. I'll just tick these off. The crisis of integration, most visibly on display at the University of Mississippi and the ensuing white mob violence in 1962. The Birmingham Children's Crusade March of May 1963. The Birmingham Riot in May of 1963. The assassination of civil rights activist Medgar Evans in June of 1963. The March on Washington, August 1963. The horrific 16th Street Baptist Church bombing. 1963 in September, the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, November 1963. The political climate was intense, but behind it all were past debts coming due in a nation in denial. What is most terrible, Baldwin writes, is that American white men are not prepared to believe my version of the story. In order to avoid believing that, they have set up in themselves a fantastic system, and here is the word of evasions denials and justifications, a system that is about to destroy their grasp of reality, which is another way of saying their moral sense." End quote. When Baldwin talks about the system of evasions, he often talks about it as Americans' insistence on their innocence. He uses innocence throughout his work to diagnose America's refusal to face their racial history. His use of the word innocence functions as a tool of political analysis. Innocence denotes attitude and point of view, which, as Baldwin argues, infuses the cultural field of American life and shapes the outlook of white Americans. Innocence involves closing one's eyes 
to others in their historical particularity, their subjectivity, to affirm an alternative and false reality. What precisely is that false reality? Well, he names it in the same essay of 1964. The people who settled the country had a fatal flaw. They could recognize a man when they saw one. They knew he wasn't anything else but a man. But since they were Christian, and since they had already decided that they came here to establish a free country, the only way to justify the role of this chattel was playing, uh, pretending as if they were not men. For if, it, for if it wasn't, or if they weren't, then no crime has been committed. That lie is the basis of our present trouble. Now we're going to return to this language of fatal flaw much later. Just hold on to it. But we should pay attention to something else for the moment, that here, Baldwin detects the attitude of evasion, the practice of evasion. To confront black pain and death involves acknowledging something about one's community. Acknowledgement shatters illusions, something that Baldwin argues is difficult, is a difficult, even if necessary, thing for society to do. And here is the difficulty. The danger, he tells his nephew in the fire next time, in the minds of most Americans, is the loss of their identity. Try to imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning to find the sun shining and all the stars aflame. Any upheaval in the universe is terrifying because it so profoundly attacks one's sense of reality. Behind this remark is Baldwin's ongoing confrontation with identity. American identity is a form of estrangement and deformation. If he tries to enable black people to see their white counterparts, he also seeks to describe to white Americans the illusions that grip them in the course. So his preoccupation with identity is also a call for his fellows to be suspicious of how they think of themselves. Estrangement is about how the meaning of American identity evades the reality of historical inheritance. When white Americans narrate the meaning of the Civil War, of Reconstruction, of the Civil Rights Movement, or the election of the first African American president, these stories function as instances of the nation's latent commitments manifest. The power of America's origin story writing the course of events. These moments in American history are not interpreted as Baldwin would encourage us to do, as deep criticisms of and tensions within the complicated identity and history of the nation. For that reason, the nation does not interpret them as departures from the founders' commitments. They do not, in other words, show us a scarred nation attempting to be born again. Deformation of our ethical capacities, the moral sense, as Baldwin often refers to them, results from this estrangement. He argues that the intensity of one's attachment to the innocence of American life matches the ease with which one abdicates responsibility for the communities to which one belongs. People who imagine, he writes a year later in 1965, that history flatters them, are impaled on their history like a butterfly on a pen and become incapable of seeing or changing themselves or the world. Our ethical capacities matter not merely because they make us attuned to the world, but also because we find our ability to remake the world in that very attunement, that sense of being alive to the demands of the world and the history that it carries. There's a striking implication. Baldwin asks his readers to consider that recast the political goals of the United States. As a form of estrangement, American identity, he also argues, evades democratic freedom. How is that possible? When freedom seems to be the thing that we're about. His picture of freedom is not novel from the 1830s to the 1940s. African Americans pushed against domination, but they also tried to get the nation to embrace what we might call a non-sovereign understanding of freedom. Freedom requires cultural and institutional support and thus requires one to be seen or taken in a certain way by your community in order to complete your freedom. 
Your ability to pursue a plan of life is dependent on the institutional and cultural resources that others put in place. And that then means we're inescapably dependent on each other to realize our freedom. That dependency does not need to be arbitrary, but we're dependent all the same. Dependency involves vulnerability, potentially realizing the inadequacies or limitations of the identities on which we rely. The identities can get in the way of us trying to realize freedom. However necessary, freedom turns out to be a hard thing to bear for those that claim innocence. And here is the rub, and however obvious it may seem to you, we must never tire of saying it and encouraging others to accept its truth. The things to which one must attend do not disappear because we close our eyes. And the inherited costs display themselves in the form of reinscribed harms that will demand a response. This point of view gives us a different take on the narration of American history, reconstruction, the civil rights movement, even the emergence of black power were not merely sites of transformative possibilities, but the manifestation of repressed trauma haunting the present. So what do we, so what do we do? Well, nothing short of a rebirth is required. A reawakening by embracing the nation's trauma as also what the nation is. Baldwin's plea is that Americans assume a different attitude, critically embrace their past, and allow both to structure a collective vision of responsibility. But just as Miral's view involved a picture of innocence against which Baldwin railed, I want to suggest Miral's view also involved a narrow conception of responsibility, inadequate to the fullness of history, and Baldwin offers us more. You all okay? All right, but to sort of see this, this view that he offers us, we have to set the stage a bit. So I want to take you to a scene in American history. Before an audience in 1963, Baldwin, Nathan Glazer, the American sociologist, Sidney Hook, philosopher, and Miral gathered for commentary symposium titled Liberalism and the Negro. Commentary is a monthly magazine founded by the American Jewish Committee in 1945, quite popular and important by the 1960s. By the 1970s, it shifts toward neoconservatism. The symposium was subsequently published in 1964, marking the 20th anniversary of American Dilemma. The symposium took stock of America's progress, African Americans' ethical and political status, and the nation's most significant dilemma. And one immediately notices that Baldwin stands apart from America's liberal defenders. But the focal point of tension is not between Baldwin and Miral, as one might have anticipated, given how I started, and not even between Baldwin and Glazer that most scholars like to talk about. The heart of the disagreement was between Baldwin and Sidney Hook. Behind Hook's critical engagement with Baldwin is a, is a broader concern about the role of history and thinking about ethical and political life. Hook tells the audience that the ethical principles of American life, by which he means the Declaration of Independence, must guide society. He concedes there is much to do to improve the life and standing of African Americans, but he insists there is little doubt that the nation has made and will continue to make progress. And then he directs his ire toward Baldwin. To argue otherwise about the nation, as he claims Baldwin does, quote, is to paralyze our ethical impulses. Throughout the exchange between Baldwin and Hook, Hook seems more consistent with Miral of the 1940s than Miral himself. Hook leans into an ideological defense of liberal democracy that is indistinguishable from his appreciation of the United States as an ethical republic. To him, Baldwin looked more like the social protest novelist Richard Wright, and Hook had already criticized him and others in the, 19, in the 1940s for pushing negative ideas about the United States. 
This ideological context and Hook's politics of vindication shaped his attitude toward the past. It shaped his attitude toward the past in thinking about racial justice and his account of responsibility. So here is Hook. Those people in the South are not responsible for the initial acts which develop the situation in which they find themselves. They can, be, they can be charged with responsibility for not playing a greater role, for not taking a more active part in the political process, but there's a tremendous difference between responsibility for a problem which you started and collective guilt for the crimes of racists. Now, there are two issues here. The first is that Hook conceives of what he calls elsewhere the Negro problem as a problem for black people that is in need of being fixed by those with whom they share society. This gives, if we're following, a specific character to the issue at hand. The problem adheres in the situation of African Americans. It is, after all, a Negro problem, he says. And thus, Hook takes the background conditions of American life for granted. We do not, in other words, treat the problem as a feature of the historical development of American institutions and as something for which we must take responsibility. And this leads to the second observation. In Hook's thinking, we can discern the outlines of what Iris Miriam Young refers to as the liability model of responsibility. Well, what is that? Well, I need to be able to causally identify you as the perpetrator of a particular act for which I'm asking you to take responsibility. It needs to causally follow from your will. And this leads him to suggest in their passage, the passage above, they were racist then, we are not now, and our responsibility extends no further than the actions we in the present have committed. History remains, but its role is diminished, lest we endanger human agency and social transformation. If the American creed is a once-born faith because it has little space for lasting anguish and little patience for the specters of the past, then Baldwin's account is very, very different in this regard. Baldwin argues that the way to a new America must run through the trauma of black life, a twice-born faith in William James's sense that does not remit the nation's failures but holds promises and betrayals clearly in view. Baldwin famously alerts his readers to this in The Fire Next Time, which I referred to at the beginning of this lecture. This line can find no counterpart in Hook's Reflections of 1963. This is Baldwin. This is the crime of which I accuse my country and my countrymen for which neither I nor time nor history will ever forgive them, that they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of black lives. Destruction not only happened, but it continues anew. To speak as he does indicates that Baldwin is not merely interested in us recalling the past or recalling past events. It's not a question of memory, he says in 1955. The man does not remember the hand that struck him the darkness that frightened him as a child. Nevertheless, the hand and the darkness remains with him, indivisible from himself, part of the passion that drives him whenever he thinks to take flight and seek light. To stand in an intimate relationship with the past requires us to acknowledge how it shapes the ground of our identity and the practical judgments that work themselves into the world through our words and our deeds. The foundational role Baldwin accords the past is likely to make us nervous, perhaps, unsettled even. There's an Old Testament sensibility in his writings and how failures in history come to weigh on the present. And worries over guilt or blame swirl about us when asked to see ourselves as responsible for the past. In our contemporary moment, it was in 2019, I'm reminded of Mitch McConnell's response to reparations for slavery. I don't think reparations for something that happened 150 years ago, he meant a little longer, for whom none of us currently living are responsible is a good idea. For a society preoccupied with innocence and that thinks of responsibility always through the liability model, Baldwin will appear to be asking us to take the fall for something we did not do. We heard it in Hook. 
And in Baldwin's famous exchange with the cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead in 1970, we can hear it again. Baldwin asked Mead to think about our connection to each other across time and how it might bind us. And to that suggestion, she responds, here's Margaret Mead. I think if one takes that position, it's absolutely hopeless. I will not accept any guilt for what anybody else did. I will accept guilt for what I did myself. The reason, she continues, if we can't control it, we're not guilty, we're not responsible. Now, there you go. Despite Baldwin's claims, he is not interested in blame or guilt. I'm not interested in somebody's guilt, he says in 1964. I'm not interested in anybody's guilt, he says in 1964. I know you didn't do it, I didn't do it either. To me, it's concerned, he says, but I'm not trying to make us guilty. Similar to Hook and Mead, Baldwin is after responsibility, but it's not of the liability kind. But I'm responsible for it, he continues, because I am a man and a citizen of this country, and you are responsible for it too. The it here obviously is the racial nightmare of American life that functions as the shared inheritance. And at just this moment, I think Baldwin's insights shine through. But it requires us to keep in view that discussion about dependency and freedom that I mentioned early on. Freedom denotes dependency, the necessity of a kind of socio-institutional ecology that creates ethical and political conditions for us to complete our freedom. And in that case, the lack of a healthy ecosystem that produces and reproduces injustices will prevent freedom's realization. For Baldwin, we should not think of this as merely a structural institutional problem, although that's part of it. But we should not merely think about that or think about it in those terms because reproduction of these injustices also lives in us, in our habits and our sensibilities and ways of relating to each other. When these institutions are at work, they create an environment of identity formation that bears our stamp. They reflect and reproduce who we are. The reproduction of racial injustice across time requires a corresponding capacious idea of responsibility to match. What Baldwin is after in his writings, we find nicely stated by Irish Marion Young, quote, shared responsibility is a responsibility I personally bear, but I do not bear it alone. I bear it in the awareness that others bear it with me. Acknowledgement of my responsibility is also acknowledgement of the inchoate collective of which I am a part which together produces injustices. Bless you. Our racial history thus requires that we, rev that we view responsibility as something we can share, even when we cannot causally see those acts as flowing from our will. So Baldwin thinks we awaken our responsibility by holding the nightmare in view. Hook suggests otherwise. Hook thinks the American creed can only survive by releasing it from its burdens. And we are struggling with this today, aren't we? Only way it can survive is we're released from the burdens. Don't open that book. Don't study that particular version of the history. Each iteration of that is taken to be a burden that we must be released from. Hook and Mirall were uninterested in asking the questions that Baldwin thought we must ask. How should we stand to the irrevocable deeds of white supremacy? What is the fate of responsibility in a democratic society given our brutal racial history? What is left of aspirational politics if the past haunts the present? We're now in the conclusion. You're all good. All right. So I've sketched a point of view that Baldwin asks us to assume. It involves us rejecting the idea of our racial innocence in order to accept the fullness of our past. And I have said that accepting the fullness of that, of that past requires us to be critically responsive to it. But in doing so, we are also positioned to embrace a form of freedom adequate to meet the demand of our shared democratic life. And with this comes a corresponding robustness to our view of responsibility, what I've called a kind of shared idea of responsibility. But there is one lingering issue to address that has to do with the weightiness of our history. And it comes in the form of the idea that I introduced early on 
the idea of an irrevocable deed, an irrevocable deed. For if deeds are irrevocable and their consequences seem to extend into the present, it is not clear why one would ever attempt to respond. One might worry that how Baldwin asks us to think about the past threatens to endanger the very notion of aspirational politics. His claim, for example, in The Fire Next Time that the country's crimes against black people are something for which he, nor time, nor history could ever forgive, or his insistence in his essays that the act of enslavement was the country's fatal flaw seems to deny transformation. The, we, the reason we are likely to think, that this, to think this way is because of how we have historically envisioned American politics. For if aspirational politics holds out the possibility of change and progress where racial justice is concerned, it must be because the nation can redeem itself through its politics. Progress, we so often think, must imply salvation. Well, I ask you to think differently about this matter. To take Baldwin seriously requires us to disentangle, dare I say, transformation and progress from redemption. This is not a tactic and it isn't a program. It is an attitude or a mood that nurtures democracy and tries to sustain the citizenry for an incomplete and perhaps incompletable journey. I don't think Baldwin says to Hook in that roundtable discussion, we can discuss this, the ethical character of the nation, unless we begin at the beginning. When he asks us to return to the beginning and the weightiness of our past, he asks us to think of the nation as Josiah Royce, our last figure in this journey, once thought of an individual that wrecked their moral universe. Here is how Royce put it in that extraordinary text of 1913, The Problem of Christianity. In his own deed, this is Royce, he has been false to whatever light he then and there had and to whatever ideal he then viewed as his highest good. Hereupon no new deed, however good or however faithful, however much of worthy consequences it introduces into the future life of the traitor and that of his community can annul the fact that the one traitorous deed was actually done. For Baldwin, the deeds are the enslavement of black people and the corresponding hierarchy of value we call white supremacy. He cannot absolve white Americans of a deformation they initiated in the nation's name, and this point holds even as he encourages his nephew to accept <coughs> his white counterparts with love. Baldwin asks his black audiences to love white people, but he also thinks this goes a long way in unburdening them with the responsibility of saving their white counterparts. Love, as we all know, is a powerful emotion. But the work of civic love always requires partners. The love from black people may point the way, Baldwin insists, to accepting one's past and is therefore important in that regard. But he says, until they, referring to his white counterparts, understand their history, they cannot be released from it. Time and history cannot serve in these roles either, although they are useful, he argues, in marking the distance the temporal distance from one's beginnings, they cannot dissolve the inherited consequences of those actions. To be released from the past or forgiven for it is not the same thing, Baldwin argues, as absolving one of the horrors that past represents in time. He refers to this as dynamic, the dynamic in time. These deeds are irrevocable and they seed it the ethical and political life we now all share. And to this thought, Margaret Mead returns. To this thought, she recoils. Listen to her. Then we've nowhere to go. On one reading, it might seem we've run into a problem. It now appears that Baldwin has seemingly traded in one origin story for another that in abandoning the optimism of the American creed, he has embraced pessimism. Baldwin says no, because, these are his words, we have atonement. To atone is to engage in reparative work. It orients the soul 
as one undertakes the work of correction, of improvement, of development, an atoning community looks back to the beginning that has given life to the harms, is perceptually attuned to how the harms ripple through time, and engages in ameliorative action so that those in the future may live more humanely in the light of their history. And in this way, atonement gives a specific meaning to our present actions in redressing racial inequalities and injustices that contrasts, for example, with the language of redemption. Redemption would aim to restore that which was broken and deliver us from the harms that follow as a result. To be, for example, redeemed through Christ, what a powerful image. It's to be delivered from one's sins. Christ on the cross is rich. It represents the emptying of the self in the form of sacrifice for humanity, thus releasing us from our sins. Baldwin, however, never invokes Christ in this role to address the tragedy of America's racial history. Moreover, it's unclear what redemption could mean, as he puts it, given the many thousands gone. There's no narrative of escape, no redeeming, no metaphysical certainty guaranteed to us by our origin story. And with this, Baldwin dispenses with the language of redemption. We should do the same. While it is true that the normative vision of democracy encourages us to dream and dream again, while it is true that this normative vision of democracy has served as a reservoir from which others have drawn in their struggle for justice and in achieving a bit of it, the fact remains that our quest for national absolution is absolutely destructive. It leads us to attach too much value to victories of racial progress and to read our historical successes as redemption. It encourages us to believe it is permissible to monetize and materialize the reparative work of atonement. It obscures that reparations, for example, is an ongoing, never-ending struggle of bending the nation's will toward freedom and equal regard. It blinds us to the fact that responding to our racial history, similar to living our democracy, depends on what Baldwin says, are choices we have, quote, got to make forever and ever and ever every day. To be sure, white supremacy is, for him, America's sin. But the source of this sin is historical, not metaphysical. It is rooted in this worldly choices. Still, sin talk has a symbolic power for him. Sin illuminates a form of wrongdoing that cuts deep, that not only touches the soul, but has a hand in the soul's construction. If our history of racial disregard lives in us, Baldwin insists, then it follows that even our affirmative confrontation with it only makes sense because we embrace the past. Or to put it differently, our affirmative gestures toward racial inequality, whether they're legal, political, institutional, only make sense because those affirmative gestures bear the memory of the betrayal. We can atone for our racial crimes, but even through our reparative work, we are reminded of the fatal betrayal, the fatal flaw. Now, maybe this will seem like to some of you, well, this is just terrible talk. I don't, I just don't feel good about myself at the end of this. Maybe it will feel like an offense to freedom. Maybe you might think, well, you can't get no aspirational politics out of this. But I want you to understand what Baldwin's aspirational politics begins and where it leads. How does one think about the development of self and society, if not by tracking how both grapple with the darkest features within as the condition for the light? Baldwin's vision is not about overcoming and thus escaping our trauma, but often living in the light of a trauma that constantly threatens to intrude on our lives. And to assume this point of view, I think, involves a radical transformation. It's possibilities here. It involves, or it envisions a society struggling to remain alive to the danger of its racial past and the present and to be perceptually on alert to how it might display itself. And this is why Baldwin describes our confrontation with the past as a ongoing battle, we don't find success in defeating the past, but in preventing it from becoming, as he says, tyrannical. Being alive to our beginnings may permit us to begin again, wounds and all. We don't overcome our national trauma, and we do not secure salvation from our inheritance. And struggling with and against both, we potentially communicate new senses of worth and value to each other through words and deeds. This is community work. 
the hard work of democracy, and it can also be the darkened light of our faith forged through the tragedy of our history. Thank you. We have a tradition here in the program that we invite our undergraduate students to ask the first question. Uh, uh, Luca, you'll want to get the questions in the microphone. Any undergraduate students? Stand up and identify yourself. Hi, Professor Rogers. Uh, thank you again for speaking today. Uh, my name is Tim Sullivan. I'm a senior at the University of Notre Dame. Um, yeah, I guess my question relates back to your discussion of responsibility, especially on that moral personal level and how it's um, the first frame that my mind took me was to the, our perspective of um, citizenship and how perhaps today people perceive citizenship as something that's very indivi individualized, um, very autonomous, as opposed to kind of this unbroken chain from the past and what we inherit from the past, whether it's good or bad, and then our duty to the future and those that will come after us. Do you think that's a helpful frame to reevaluate our perspective of like responsibility in this discussion? Or that's kind of what my question would center around, I think. Um, I mean, if I, so, so I would say that the uh, one, one different reading that one could provide on the Miral Hook and Baldwin discussion was not to just sort of take liberalism in its grand form, um, but to take a sort of one of the constituent elements of it, the idea of individualism, and how that is meant to sort of function. And one alternative reading, right, is that um, Baldwin is very suspicious of a certain kind of individualism that is constantly looking inward toward oneself as the exclusive site of agency and responsibility. And Baldwin would say that that will bump up against one's positionality in a community that comes into existence through a wider tradition of ideas, of practices, and of choices, some of which are quite dark choices. And so Baldwin does believe in the individual. It matters a great deal. But, but in this period, um, and he's not unique in, in this regard, uh, it's a conception of the individual that can't be pulled apart from, 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 the, from the community, right? I mean, you and I may very well depend, uh, to use a very different example, you and I may very well depend um, uh, on uh, the alphabet to make uh, sentences. And those sentences bind us together. Um, but that very same alphabet that binds you and I together is what's going to allow you to make novel sentences, right? And me to make some new ones that are going to be different than yours. But there's no way to understand that independent of this, of this shared thing on which we rely. And Baldwin would want to say the same thing. Thank you for an excellent lecture. I'm, my name's John Luke Cohenhout. I'm a PhD student here in political science. And uh, some of the language that you were using reminded me of the rhetoric that Lincoln employed, um, for example, in the Gettysburg Address when he talks about the new birth of freedom. Mm -hmm. And in his second inaugural address when he uh, says that the whole nation bears responsibility both for slavery and the Civil War. Um, so I was just wondering how you see Lincoln fitting in this story and if, if um, his ideas and politics kind of align with Baldwin's. Well, I, I would say, right, the binding of the wounds in Lincoln, right? There's the binding part, the wounds, right? And, and the scars that will exist once the bandages come off. And of course, Lincoln thought um, this all is going to still continue to come do, right? So, you know, so I would, um, I think on a careful reading of, of Lincoln, in particular Lincoln's relationship to history um, and what the history of enslavement meant, means uh, and what it will continue um, uh, uh, to mean for the nation, 
I think it could fit, it fits very nicely alongside what, what Baldwin is, is talking about, right? And, you know, interestingly enough, I mean, Lincoln, you know, as, as politicians run around wanting to invoke various, uh, you know, presidents and the, and the like, on this business about history and what kind of history should be taught, you know, there's, there's good value in turning to Lincoln. Right. Can I follow up on that question? Um, Lincoln speaks of a new birth of freedom. Mm -hmm. but the new birth, of course, is baptism, be reborn mm -hmm. in Christ in a Christian sense, which means a f implies a forgiveness of the original sin. Is that well, thought compatible with Baldwin? Well, remember I said forgiveness Baldwin agrees that forgiveness can take hold, but forgiveness is not absolution. And I think the same thing applies to Lincoln. I think interpretively, if we sat with some text, I could make this argument stick. Professor Hunt. Thanks. That was okay. um, thank you, Melvin. That was a wonderful lecture, as always. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about the critique of Baldwin as too pessimistic, perhaps similar to Richard Wright. Mm -hmm. Because uh, interestingly, Lorraine Hansberry, uh, the um, queer black Marxist playwright who wrote A Raisin in the Sun, mm -hmm. first major Broadway play to be written by a black woman, perhaps even a black American, if I remember correctly. Um, she also thought Richard Wright was too pessimistic. And she devoted a lot of her writing to develop an antidote mm -hmm. to that pessimism that she saw in the black intellectual tradition. Now, Lorraine Hansberry, as you know, was a student of Du Bois in the 50s, studied um, international thought with Du Bois. Mm -hmm. And um, Du Bois is another figure who sometimes is accused of turning away from hope mm -hmm. towards pessimism, especially mm -hmm. in that mid-century moment of course, he returns to Ghana in the end. Um, in some sense, some people see that as a rejection of the mm -hmm. American world in favor of um, the pan-Africanism that he espoused at that period. Um, and some people see that as a pessimistic move, mm -hmm. not an optimistic move. So my question for you is, given this landscape in the mid 20th century in black thought, which is incredibly complex, mm -hmm. um, even with uh, figures like Hansberry and Wright mm -hmm. kind of battling it out, right? <laughs> um, who shared so much, you know, um, in their backgrounds. Uh, what labels are we meant to apply now mm -hmm. and how we read them? So in, I know from my study of um, science fiction, uh, it's little known that some of these figures, like Du Bois, wrote science mm -hmm. fiction. Mm -hmm. um, or a little, little acknowledged, mm -hmm. let's say, little acknowledged. Um, but there's a debate uh, whether we should call these um, black writers of science fiction um, Afro-pessimists mm -hmm. or Afro-futurists. Mm -hmm. And what do you think would be the better label to describe right, right. This, this, this group that you're concerned with? Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful question. I mean, the, th the thing I would say about Baldwin, I mean, by the time we get to um, No Name in the Street in 1972, you know, B Baldwin is intellectually and, and, and emotionally just really sort of unsettled about the fate of the nation. But of course, Baldwin s stays and continues to argue against, even as Reagan is preparing the ground for his ascendancy um, uh, to the presidency. It seems to me that that, co that commitment by Baldwin um, and what he has to say in No Name in the Street still suggests a Baldwin that sort of has faith in the country and a kind of faith that on his own account is constantly being betrayed by the evidence on the ground. Although for his part, he thinks that faith always exceeds the, the, the sort of evidence on the, on, on the ground. If we're thinking about descriptions of these figures, I mean, I tend to think Wright is a bit more complicated than the pessimism argument. You know, Baldwin's critique of, of Wright is very interesting. There's a kind of internal politics to, to black life in this, in this moment. Baldwin trying to make some room for himself and these kinds of things. Um, I, I think that's, I, I don't, I, I think that the, the 
the label of, of, if we wanted to apply pessimism to right, it would be inappropriate. And in fact, I think that right is also a defender of this kind of chastened aspirational politics. Uh, I mean, for God's sake, you know, right fancies himself a defender of, a defender of enlightenment ideals. Um, so, so, you know, um, uh, so I tend to think that in this period, there's some infighting, there's some misdescriptions. When we sit down with the work, we see something different. Um, if we're going to call it an Afrofuturism, it has to be an Afrofuturism that can sort of anchor itself in the material world, right? Um, not an Afrofuturism that really sort of, um, that really is all out sci-fi and sort of defies the bits and pieces of the resources that one could, that one could re rely on. So that's what I offer up for that. I think we can, ooh, we've got a lot of questions. Let's, let's try to go quickly and we'll get to it. Okay, you're okay, okay. Uh, Luke and then Professor Philpott, go down the line. Oh, thank you again. Uh, Luke Foster, I'm a, a postdoc here with the center. In your remarks on Baldwin on history, I'm reminded of, I think in 1965, um, what Russell Kirk said when watching a, a TV interview of uh, uh, Malcolm X, right? Mm. On the uprootedness that black Americans can feel and in, in, in feeling because of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, a lack of an organic transmission of history and a, and a kind of coherent past, right? Mm -hmm. And Kirk said something like, I'm forgetting his exact words, but in X, I see a recognition of the problem with liberalism that I've been trying to get conservatives to recognize. Mm -hmm. That merely making America about natural rights and in abstract principles is too, too uprooted doesn't pay enough attention to history. So if that sounds plausible, I mean, do you see resources in engaging with conservative thought particularly for making this Baldwinian case that history is always there and it's always ours whether or not we like it? In a way that seems there's more potential for that in some ways than the, the, the kind of centrist liberal tradition that Baldwin is criticizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, that sounds, you know, that sounds plausible to me, you know. Um, it ultimately depends on how you, you know, what history we're talking about and how we're going to stand in relation to it, right? Um, uh, we were talking about this in a car, you know, um, we had a civil war. And if, if someone to say Lee and Grant were both heroes, well, we got an issue here. Um, it is descriptively the case that both, that both were involved in the, in the war. Um, but to claim them both as heroes, well, we're going to run into a problem, right? Now, how am I able to say that we're going to run into the problem? It's because I'm making a moral judgment about, about what the nation was committed to and ought to be committed to that allows me to make that distinction. And if you want to insist on claiming that Lee and Grant are both heroes and thus, uh, as the daughters of the Confederate, we ought to have uh, statues to honor these figures, then I don't know that you and I sort of share the same set of commitments. I don't know if uh, I should be uh, open um, to us getting on together. And I have every reason to believe, um, given what I think that the nation is really about, that you're engaged in deep and profound betrayal. Right? So once again, it depends on what history we're talking about. It depends on the moral vision that's going to overlay Right? What, how we come to emphasize some facts over others and where they stand uh, in, that, in, uh, in our narration of history. Well, thank you so much, Dan Philpott in Political Science. I wanted to ask about your uh, distinction between redemption and atonement uh, you mentioned towards the end. And um, I think I understand your critique of uh, redemption, but what are the qualities of atonement that um, distinguish it and make it more um, appealing? And then I wanted to ask, are there any practices, the three that I would mention are reparations, apology, and forgiveness, mm -hmm. practiced on a collective political level. Is there, are there, is, there, is there any possibility of these practices having a, you know, a positive meaning that could avoid some of the problems of redemption and be mm -hmm. more... Um, you know, fulfilling of an aspirational vision. Right, right, right. Well, I would say on the atonement, right, because uh, uh, I know we got a, a couple more questions. On the atonement, right, as I said earlier, um, 
over breakfast, it really is about being at one with the grievances um, that, are on, that are on the table. And that being at one is about a kind of openness and aliveness to um, how the choices that one, that, that one has made for which one now is, a, is atoning reverberates, reverberates across, across time. I think what I'm suggesting that Baldwin is offering, he doesn't yet have a program, okay, well, what would this look like practically? But the program can't even come on the table if you don't think that history is the kind of thing that weighs on us in the way Baldwin is suggesting and for which we should have an atoning spirit. So if I can get, so Baldwin's thought is if I can bring you there, then we can begin the conversation about, okay, what would be the practices that would instantiate Right? And one of the dangers around reparations, and this is, not, this is not a critique of reparations as much as it is a critique of a society that is presented with reparations. One of the problems with reparations is that one could imagine that if something like reparations, monetary land were enacted, one could imagine that one's white counterparts, even some black counterparts would say, okay, the matter is settled. In the same way as I used this morning, the example of Bill Bennett vis-a-vis -vis Obama's election. No more excuses, right? Well, that's because the orientation behind it is the quest for redemption and salvation. And so we have to sort of change that sort of characterological orientation so as to prepare the ground properly to receive reparations in, in, in the right way. Thus, reparations wouldn't be a one and done thing. It would be our shared, just think about it, it would be our shared project. Not just for black, it would be our shared project. All right? but, a, but a number of things would, would, would need to happen. Of course, we now have to deal with another feature of this, the, the status of fairness and unfairness in our discourse. All right? That's a shared project that seemed to materially only benefit once. Oh, wait a second now, we gotta look at the inequity and see, we gotta work through this, All right? So that's, so that's, what, I would, that's what I would offer up. Professor, thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, my question is rather broad, so feel free to take it in whichever direction you'd like. But uh, our discussions of history and, and pessimism reminded me of a quote of James Baldwin that's been circulating quite frequently over the past few years particularly on uh, platforms like the Washington Post and, and what have you, uh, regarding reflections on a divided America. I forget where he said this, but he once said that I love America more than any other country in the world, and it is precisely for this reason that mm -hmm. I reserve the right to criticize her perpetually. Mm -hmm. What in your mind, based on your scholarship, did Baldwin mean by that quote in his day Mm -hmm. And what does that mean for us now? How should we interpret it today? Well, that's the Socratic move, isn't it? <laughs> we think of, what do we think of? The apology. Remember at the very beginning of the apology? Right? Socrates, is, look, I'm going to say these things. I might be rambling. These people are going to have adorned speeches and the like. They're lying. I'm telling you the truth. And Socrates' point in the apology is, or at least on my reading, I gotta be careful, got classicists in this, but at least on my reading, the question is, right, must truth be beautiful before you accept it? Are you willing to accept the ugliness? And as we come a little further down in the, in the text, when Socrates has some options to get out of this, right, let's stop philosophizing. And Socrates says, no, I'm gonna philosophize anywhere and direct it to all those that come in, but especially you, because you're close to me like Ken. And it seems to me that, that, that Baldwin carries this sort of Socratic insight, that however it is, well, we know the story of how black folks have found their way here, right? Um, we know why they're in the United States, right? We know that history and we know what it has shaped but we're here together. We gotta figure out how to get on. And, and Baldwin's critique emerges from this deep and passionate love and affection for the polity, right? It is a form of patriotism that always is standing at the edges, the borders of society, not in the center. We should be suspicious of the ones who claim patriotism, who 
seem to always say the right thing in the center of the, right? It, the patriots are the ones at the edges who don't always quite seem to fit right, but who seem to be trying to call us to something, to something higher. And, and my thought is, is that we must sort of embrace um, the kind of Socratic orientation, or the kind of Socratic ethic that I think we see at work in someone like Bolton. Right? And the question is whether or not we're willing to take it up. Are we willing, as Cornel West would say, not the presidential candidate, the other version of Cornel West, but as, as Cornel West, you know, Cornel West would say, look, are we willing to let portions of ourselves die? so that we might grow more humanely. Right. So. The gentleman in the back has been waiting patiently, so we'll make this a little sure. bit past that, but we'll make this the last one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you so much for uh, being here, Professor. I uh, really appreciate it, and it was a fantastic lecture. Um, in The Fire Next Time, Baldwin uh, heavily implies growing violence and uh, tensions over the lack of change in the American status quo. And um, he specifically uh, brings out a biblical reference uh, saying, no more water to the fire next time. Mm -hmm. uh, in reference to, um, uh, he doesn't directly call it sort of America's last chance. He is, remains hopeful about the future. But how would aspirational politics treat or interact with violence and growing um, tension and frustration with the maintaining status quo? Yeah, I mean, that's just, just a different. It's just a different foundation for things. The use of, right, the deployment of, this is not a sort of claim against, right, but the deployment of violence um, is an attempt to remove the obstacle to transformation. That once they are so moved, then the ground is fresh again, upon which a new aspirational politics might be articulated. But that's just a very different path. And when, when Baldwin deploys it, and I'll end on this point, when he deploys that language, I tend to sort of read this moment rhetorically uh, in the way that you have sort of seen it throughout African-American political thought. David Walker deployed this language in 1830, but David Walker didn't seem to be properly leaning into the claim, look, we really should come to blows on this, on this. So it's a rhetorical move that's about, look, if you care about freedom as much as you say you do, if you think that it's foundational to what it means to be a human being, then you must understand that it is just as you have fought against the British crown, then so too are black Americans and any American not properly recognized as, as equal and free are well within their rights to do, to do similarly. Are you willing to invite that, right? So I tend to sort of read that moment in Baldwin as a kind of rhetorical move to alert Americans of what their commitments entail. Before we thank Professor Rogers, let me just thank again my staff. Uh, there's a number of faculty members who have been with us all since early this morning, Professor Hughes and Professor Finner, Finner Hughes, Professor Phil, Professor Collins, and especially uh, Professor Hunt, who's now going to, uh, we're, we're keeping you busy. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. This morning, and, uh, Professor Rogers is about to meet with Professor Hunt's class. Um, Professor Rogers, that was a phenomenally good lecture. Oh, thank thank you. you for traveling here, and please join me. Uh, thank you. For oh, thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, it was great. It was great. Thank you. I know a few of you have some books. You'll sign a few books. Sure, sure. Oh, if you have mm -hmm. a book, please, please give it time. Yeah. My thing's over here.